I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you, this is kind of a weird one. So, let me ask you a question. You're walking around, and you discover a bunch of white junk bubbling up from the ground. Is your first instinct to taste it and find out what it is? Well, if it is, congratulations! You've won the grand prize of a parasite eating you from the inside out, while all really just controlling your meat suit. So with that perfect segue set up, deep in the heart of West Georgia, about 30 miles from where I am currently, the same substance emerges from underneath the ground to the interest of some people who find it. Taste testing this material, they determine that it is sweet and upon further examination, realize it also has no calories as well, making it the perfect dessert food. But the age-old adage of just because it's coming up from the ground doesn't mean you should eat it applies here. You know, that one that we've all definitely heard of. However, because of its sweet taste, it would immediately and without caution be thrown to the consumers everywhere who would become quickly addicted to this white sweet tasting substance. So in today's episode, we again will be talking about a weird one, but we are talking about the parasitic creature from the movie The Stuff and how it affects the bodies and ultimately the brain of a person controlling and then piloting their bodies quite literally like a meat mech. So down in the chapter bar if you would like to skip ahead to the talking about the parasite you can actually find the jump ahead point there but for everyone else let's discuss this fever dream of a movie and how I mean if you haven't seen this it's definitely worth a watch but you might have to actually watch it twice because it's just such a bizarre set of circumstances leading up to everything. It's sort of like if an alien read the spark notes on human interaction and then was like oh yeah I bet I could make a movie that people would watch and then somehow it turned out to be kind of like a successful venture because here we are. Anyhow, let's get to why A, it doesn't snow in southwest Georgia, and B, don't eat strange white substances you happen to find on the ground. We begin our story with the most unbelievable aspect. It's snowing in Midland, Georgia. Trust me, it's like 99 degrees in October down here. These people wouldn't just be casually strolling around in the snow, they'd be running to go buy milk and bread. But as one man trots along with a flashlight, he ends up discovering something coming up from the ground. As he tests it, he realizes that it's sweet. He convinces is his friend to try it, and realizing that there's enough to sell, a business venture is born. We now jump over to Jason. Apparently he's like sick or something, and he's burning up. He heads downstairs as he's hungry and wants to get some food. Opening the fridge, he sees that his parents have bought the stuff. As he looks at it, he realizes that it's actually moving in the fridge. His dad comes out of nowhere like super aggressive for no reason. I'm guessing the house is like on lockdown, but he sends his kid to bed and then begins eating the stuff himself. We now move on to a group of businessmen talking about what the stuff is, being the owners of ice cream companies, they have gotten together to hire a business saboteur to divulge what exactly this stuff is made out of. They haven't been able to figure out the ingredients and are losing a ton of business to it as well, which we now meet our main protagonist, David Mo Rutherford. Or just Mo, because Mo parasitic entity capable of wiping out humanity, more problems. As he comes on board the ship, he begins reciting to everyone what they've been talking about, which disturbs the businessmen to some degree. But as they question him how he knew exactly what they were talking about, it comes out that he slipped a microphone into the pocket of one of them and has been listening in showing his skills that he has at infiltrating and discovering information without others' knowledge. Having come from the FBI and then been let go, he has been trained in the exact tactics needed to do this. Moving back to the family, as they sit around eating breakfast, Jason finally comes downstairs. His old man, I mean, this dude seems like kind of a chotch. Like, I mean, you just have to watch the movie, but this dude really just needs to settle down. But anyways, he tells his son that he really doesn't want to missing any more days of school for being sick. As his older brother finishes up his breakfast, he goes to get some of the stuff from the fridge, clearly addicted. His brother tells him not to eat it, and the mom grabs it and tries it, and then tries to give Jason some, but he yeets it out of her hands and then runs off. Meanwhile, Mo is at the lab, attempting to figure out if his people have isolated the contents of what composes the stuff. The scientist working on it says it reproduces and replenishes itself. As they discuss why the FDA hasn't really released any list of ingredients, another man chimes in, saying the whole reason as to why they don't have to is the same reason why Coke doesn't divulge what's in its secret formula either. So they are protected via a law that protects company secrets. Realizing he's not going to be able to isolate its compounds from testing it, he decides to go after the marketing team. Heading to a commercial shoot, he ends up talking to the woman who has orchestrated the whole PR for the stuff from the beginning. Attempting to get close to her, he poses as a petroleum liaison, and then he lies, basically telling her that he wants to buy her firm and then put her in charge, which I suppose makes sense. They agree to go get some food together and then discuss the deal. Meanwhile, Jason is having a freak out, rampaging through a store, which you think it'd be easier than it is to stop one kid, he tries to get all the stuff off the shelves and destroy it. While he does this though, some are already addicted to it and then try to eat it, which is interesting in the background, a little bit of foreshadowing there. But eventually, however, they are able to subdue him. Realizing that Mo needs to go to the FDA, he now heads to a member of the FDA who's in charge, or at least was in charge at the time, of the stuff being given the green light. As he enters the home, he finds the man is a little fearful of his dog. However, as they continue to talk, Mo questions Mr. Vickers why everyone else who was around at the time the stuff was okayed either resigned 
mind, became recently deceased, or has left the country, and about how long it was tested before it was good to go. Mr. Vickers basically says because it's a dessert, they didn't really need to test it at all. All he knows is he eats it and he feeds his dog it all the time. As Mr. Vickers goes upstairs, Mo goes to check the kitchen and finds the kitchen is just completely filled with the stuff. Mr. Vickers then comes back down and hands him the files on where it was tested. Later that night, around 3 a.m., Mo stops off at a place to get food and finds that a lot of people are still up and they're all getting the stuff. While that's going on, Mr. Vickers is then straight up attacked by his dog. While the attack is happening, he tries to call for help, but the dog pulls the phone cord out of the wall, interestingly showing a higher level of thought than what is native to just a dog. And then it either begins to eat Mr. Vickers, which I assume it's eating him, either that or it's just infecting him. It's not really explicitly shown which it is. So now Mo is sent to Virginia where the testing took place. He then stops off at a gas station where we see a pretty sweet 1969 Impala in the background, but objectively speaking, we all 1967 is the best model of Impala. Or, as some people say, Impala. It's Impala. Straight up. Anyways, as they begin discussing where everyone is, Mo asks the gas station attendant whose car that is down the road. The attendant doesn't really know, and Mo goes to check it out. As he does this, the attendant runs off into the woods like a complete weirdo. Approaching the car, Mo ends up getting attacked by a man called Chocolate Chip Charlie. He is the owner of a company who was recently bought out by the stuff, and he's trying to find out what happened to everyone as this was their forwarding address. They go to the post office and realize that all the letters are coming from Midland, Georgia. As they talk to the guy who runs the post office, he's acting strangely, but eventually he leaves them to go in the back. They decide that they need to follow him to get some more information, but then they hear a noise coming from behind the door. As they attempt to beat down the door, the stuff is then seen exiting out the window. They then find the post office man's body with his mouth distended way too far. Jumping out the window, they eventually are accosted by a group of men. As they fight them, the bodies begin falling apart as they are infected with the stuff. Before they can finish their attack, they flee on a boat and then go to the next town. Mo asks the diner's waitress to see if they have any stuff, which she says no. However, she's got a ton in the back. Mo and Chocolate Chip Charlie part ways to conduct investigations on their own at this point. Back at a city, Mo is starting to attract attention. A van carrying the stuff tries to hit him after being reported by someone working a stuff cart. After the close call, Mo goes higher up the chain to the distributor of the stuff. After a few words back and forth, their discussion becomes pretty hostile. The distributor then tries to pay off Mo to basically just get him to go away. Then later, walking with Nicole, he finally tells her what he's really doing. He's not a millionaire oil tycoon, but instead is a business saboteur. And then she actually takes it pretty well. He informs her that the stuff appears to be bad, and she starts asking why he hasn't gone to the authorities yet. Claiming that he has no sway with them, he states that he's basically on his own, with this one more so because he doesn't have any proof as of yet. Back at the family's house, Jason is still on restriction. He goes downstairs, assumedly to see what's for dinner, and as he enters the kitchen, he finds all the food has been thrown in the trash can and only the stuff is left. His family continues eating the stuff and then tries to get him to, but he declines. His dad goes on about how the stuff kills the bad things inside them, and he attempts to run, but his brother ends up dragging him back into the house. The dad gives Jason the stuff, and then Jason goes upstairs, which you would figure they would want to watch him eat it. But instead of going to his room, he then goes to the bathroom and puts the stuff in the toilet, to which it freaks out and then tries to crawl away, but he flushes it. He then fills up the cup with shaving cream. Going back downstairs, he's questioned by his infected brother. He eats some of the shaving cream to convince everyone he's good to go, and as Jason continues eating the shaving cream, he then goes to throw up. His dad tries the stuff and realizes that it's actually just Barbasol, so as he sprints away from his family, somehow Mo shows up after having read the paper and grabs the kid before he can get got by his family. They evacuate basically to a plane to fly to Midland, Georgia, and which essentially has become kidnapping at this point, right? But it doesn't matter because they're going on an adventure. As Mo and Nicole meet the producers of the stuff, they sent some infected back to the plane to take out the pilots. As it begins seeping into the plane, Jason takes off towards the woods as not to be infected. Meanwhile, in the production plant, they talk to the foreman about how the stuff is produced, but just like everyone else, he's pretty tight-lipped about it. At this point, Jason happens to find the production plant. Like, what are the odds that he ran the right way through the woods and cave systems, and then just got all the way here? But hiding within a transport truck, eventually he's locked in the back, as the workers did not know he was in there. Later that night, the plant has set up Mo and Nicole with a room, and apparently they're dating now or something. I mean, that was pretty quick. Anyhow, as they sleep, the stuff starts exiting the pillow and then attacks Mo. Not able to remove it from his face, Nicole just straight lights it on fire. A man then enters the room and begins attacking, but then is attacked by the stuff. I'm not sure if he was infected or not, or just thought something else was going on. It's never really said. But it is now shown that the stuff is extremely susceptible to fire. And then they leave the motel and steal his truck. So in another stroke of luck, Mo and Nicole happen upon the trucks going to get the stuff. As the trucks pull up, they show that the stuff is literally just being pumped up from the ground. Mo and Nicole do some spying on the collecting procedure and realize there is no manufacturer 
manufacturing process, no creation of it. It's literally just coming up from the ground. Mo puts on a uniform to blend in and then heads down to steal a truck and plant concussive detonators. Meanwhile, Jason is still in the tank of the truck as it's being filled up with the stuff. As Mo walks through, he ends up hearing Jason talking to the stuff and realizes that he's in the tanker truck. He steals the truck and detonates the plant's concussive exponentiators. Jason now has this weird moment with the stuff saying that's like inside his head. I honestly don't know what this kid's on about. But as Mo returns to Nicole, he gets there just in time to stop her from being attacked by running over her assailant. And then he releases Jason from the tanker before he can be consumed. Heading down the road, they eventually are stopped by the cops. As he holds them at force multiplied point, they pretend like they want the stuff. The cop finally caves and then goes back to eat it too, showing that the police are under control by the stuff as well. Mo knocks out the cop and then attempts to go to a large city, which may not be under control of the stuff. Mo takes the tanker to a militia group at this point who were initially worried about communists and fluoride in the water. Again, it's a straight fever dream movie. Also, never go communist, kids. Mo tells the colonel that there is something much worse than fluoride and begins telling him about the stuff and how America is in danger. Then the colonel agrees to help. A man is sent with a tanker truck to begin the attack on the production plant. As the driver mentions how there should probably be like a cash reward, he gives a signal and he says that he won't bring in the truck without the reward. Then he gets domed by the guard who then gets lit up by the soldiers. Okay, so this whole this whole thing is ridiculous. This kid is still like running around with the adults there and like it's like a battle, right? So why is the kid there? And also Mo's still wearing his uniform and he looks like everybody else. I don't know. Maybe they should have changed clothes or leave the kid behind. Like what even is this movie? But as the soldiers move in, they meet no resistance. They eventually find the workers are all on the ground and basically hollow inside, meaning the stuff has really just turned them into shells of their former self. Mo then goes on this like weird monologue about how do you shoot anything like if it's inside you. Like I really think they started to lose the plot in the fourth act of this movie. Regardless, as Jason and Nicole leave, the stuff begins giving chase to them. They burst a tank on the stuff and then it exits the facility and nothing really happens after that. Oh, and fun fact, just so you know during this scene, uh, the stuff is basically made out of fish bones that were pulverized into dust and the smell was so bad that the actors would immediately go to a river after filming anything concerning it to rinse it off because it stunk to high heaven. The soldiers now head into Atlanta to the colonel's radio station to warn the rest of the American population of the danger that the stuff poses. While in the radio station, Chocolate Chip Charlie shows up and begins talking about how he has something to say. Mo asks where he's been because he never got any information from the FBI, which was supposed to be Charlie's task. The colonel says Charlie is allowed to stay, and then Nicole goes with Charlie to the broadcasting room. Charlie tells Nicole that he's seen what's left of people who have been infected. Charlie then grabs Nicole's arm, and it becomes apparent that he's infected with the stuff as well. As Nicole and Jason are trapped, they break the glass, and then Mo uses a power cord to shock the stuff. And this has got to be like the worst use of green screen effect ever. God, I love the 80s. Because you can definitely see it as like Jason's going over the colonel. It looks ridiculous. Anyways, all is well now. The colonel gets on the radio and begins telling everyone about the stuff. Basically, he says that they need to get rid of it as fast as possible. So overnight, the public turns against the stuff and begins destroying anything associated with it. The casualties numbered in the thousands over consumption of it, however. Charlie now approaches the distributor and the ice cream producer as well. Now understanding what the stuff is, they added in some ice cream to make it about 12% stuff. It won't cause people to get addicted or affected by it because of the low concentration. They say that they tested it on a small town when questioned about it, and then when asked if they will eat it, they decline. Then Mo holds them at force multiplier point and forces them to eat the stuff, introducing the parasite into their bodies, which will ultimately take them out. While all this is happening, some of the stuff has managed to remain, which will now flood the black market. So I think a good place to start initially with the stuff is what is it actually supposed to be? Well, it would seem to me the first and most obvious choice is that it is a microorganism of some sort that can combine together to form sort of like a macro organism. What's strange is normally it would be called a multicellular animal, but this creature appears to be a conglomeration of individual consciousness to make up a more functional and sentient threat, which becomes a more intelligent single consciousness. And there's a reason I think this. Concerning all the workers who were infected, while the giant mass collectively comes out of them, even though it was a single sort of piece, it could still have a common goal amongst all the pieces and then reform into one another, which would mean that it's not just one process, but instead upon separating, it may decrease its thinking capacity somewhat. However, upon rejoining its larger self, the consciousness is added together. And this would make it more capable than a multicellular organism such as ourselves and much more able to overcome humanity than a single cell organism might be able to. And this is why this substance even reacts aggressively to humanity in the first place. Upon being discovered by humans, it immediately started to have pieces of its consciousness ripped away from the conglomerate located underground, which as you might imagine would not be ideal. And then humanity started eating the substance without really knowing what it was. This in turn created an aggressive response from the stuff. Despite it being parasitic, 
parasitic, the reality is it likely was more being defensive and saw humanity as a threat and thus controlled those who it could to ensure its own survival by continuing to grow itself under the ground as so it could infect the aggressor species effectively, which would then lead to the downfall of its predator. But the question is, what sort of microorganism would the stuff actually be? Well, judging by its location and the climate that it hails from considering I know where Midland, Georgia actually is, it's basically about as human as a well digger's butt crack. And I would have to say, the stuff is actually a form of yeast for a multitude of reasons. Canada albicans is found virtually all over the planet and is likely to exist on plant surfaces, but what's most interesting is it can exist in soils. The soils is an interesting aspect seeing as this is exactly where the stuff is located. But it's the effects that are relatively unknown until recently that yeast can actually have on the human body that gives us more credence as to it being aggressive based on what it is able to do to humans neurologically. The first thing to understand about the stuff organism and it being potentially a form of yeast is that it would most definitely not be yeast as you think of it in a conventional sense. Instead, this would need to be an organism that has been under the ground for some time, likely feeding on the matter within the soil itself and was discovered by human activity. It may be extremely localized to the area of Georgia simply due to the fact that nobody else has found it elsewhere on the planet. And this would mean that likely it is an offshoot of Canada albicans and likely may even have its own subspecies designation at this point. Of course, the interesting aspect of this being a single-celled colony is that it's capable of what appears to be sentient thought and would in some cases point to it being otherworldly or maybe have just landed here. However, based on what's in the movie, there are no indicators that support this being the case and instead it is a naturally occurring organism that is completely homegrown. This may sound odd, more so when you take into account how the organism is able to use its conglomeration of cells to move about, attack, and interact with multicellular organisms on equal footing, but when you take into account that even today we have colonies of bacteria secreting film-like substances to protect themselves from antibiotics, it's not too difficult to see a group of single-celled organisms being aggressive towards anything that might be attacking it. Okay, so let's get something out of the way. This movie was actually marketed as a horror movie, but was originally intended to be a satirical comedy. As such, there are things about the yeast which it may not actually be able to do, as this would really defy conventional explanation concerning how it moves and formulate ideas, but we will still go into what we can and discuss how these cells may be working together in order to form an effective resistance against man, and how it affects the human brain, and also why it became so addictive to humans in the first place. Concerning movement, while not completely impossible for a single-celled organism to move, they typically do so very slowly and in no way quick enough to overwhelm a human being. Well, overwhelm a human being in this aspect. They can definitely get in your body and overwhelm you. But that becomes even more difficult for yeast to move in an environment as such because yeast cells are considered non-modal and essentially encased in a cell wall, much like how you would find plants encased in cell walls, or at least their cells encased in cell walls. That being said, much like how a Venus flytrap has cell walls, they too can close, allowing them to catch prey. Should the yeast have chosen a more predatory evolutionary path, say to catch insects within the ground to fuel the superorganism it had growing, over time, this may have given them the ability to move and be much more deadly than its ancestors may have been. And this could have easily evolved to fill a niche that was otherwise unoccupied, which we see happening all the time with animals. And this may actually be why this allows them to lumber across surfaces, but something as simple as contracting the underside of the mass backwards while having the top half of the mass move forward, this may allow it to actually achieve locomotion. And this possibly indicates that there are points on the cell's surface allowing it to stick to one another, much like almost a Velcro effect. The ability to stick together but remain a single-celled organism would make them strange in the aspect as you wouldn't outright call it a multicellular organism, but when together, they're not really a single-celled organism either. They appear to be able to communicate with one another through signaling, likely in a way that is different from, say, neurological activity in humans, but kind of like how the skin cell, when under attack by bacteria from, say, a cut, may communicate with the immune system that there's an invader. These cells are capable, likely through hormones within the stuff itself, to signal other nearby cells, who then signal others, and so on and so forth, to communicate movement, or to hold on to an imminent threat to subdue it. Or possibly, even when humans are harvesting pieces of the upper portion from the ground to reproduce and replenish itself as it's under attack. And this allows it to form a somewhat of a resistance to species that appears to be aggressive considering it can latch onto a person's face and suffocate them. That said, moving on to the portion of what it does to the human body, it has many other strategies in which it's able to subdue an aggressor and subsequently eliminate the threat that they pose. Upon the stuff entering the body, the first place it would obviously hit is the tongue. It is said to have a sweet taste, yet it's low in calories to having zero calories. This may sound strange, but it still continues to hint at it being yeast. Likely there is something known as sugar alcohol being produced by the substance. This type of sugar is sweet tasting to humans and has very little calories because it's a sugar alcohol. And this is what's actually 
used in a lot of weight loss foods nowadays and to add in the sweet taste without the caloric intake. Sugar alcohol has also been known to make people crave it more down the line, but there's also still a lot more going on than just the taste of it. As it goes down the esophagus and into the stomach, this is where it'll start to set in. The thing being a yeast subspecies is that it likely does have the cell wall as mentioned previously. Even in regular yeast, it's really difficult for our bodies to break it down, and commonly, you'll actually find yeast living within our intestines anyways. So as it sits in the stomach, it would not be broken down, and one of the things that the infected note is that they are never hungry anymore or tired, and they just crave the stuff. Having a stomach full of this would definitely negate any hunger that comes up as any ghrelin from having an empty stomach that is usually activated to say you're hungry would not do anything because your stomach is full. This is essentially how the mom lost five pounds in a week as she wasn't gaining any nutrients or caloric intake, but her body wasn't telling her she was hungry. Problem is, there is likely another thing happening to her body at this point. After residing in the stomach for a while, it's clear because the organism's ability to move via its own will, it would move into other parts of the intestine. While likely not destroying it yet, it would eventually backtrack into the bloodstream and be swept away to every other part of the body. And there is one portion of the body that would be catastrophically bad, and we call this bad boy the brain. It is known right now, through recent research, that the yeast sometimes has the ability to travel through the bloodstream, say if an infection were breaking out, and then move through the blood-brain barrier of a brain and into the neurological tissue itself. Once there, it'll rustle the jimmies of the brain's immune cells, which in turn will attempt to destroy the yeast. The issue is, however, this will also destroy the cells surrounding the battle, which can lead to a form of dementia brought on by the yeast. It's really not ideal for anyone. But what's concerning is this is not always effective. We rely on the blood-brain barrier to protect our brains from attackers, but if something like the stuff were to get in, which is completely possible seeing as its yeast counterparts can, then that does not bode well for the person's natural defenses in taking this stuff out. And really, it might not be able to at all. We see after eating a certain amount of the stuff, which the ice cream makers claimed if they kept it below 12%, that it would never get a foothold in the mines, which how they arrived at this conclusion, uh, spoiler alert, they didn't. You could always just eat more of what they made, which was called the taste, and it would just infect you anyways. But this kind of shows that it does take time for a small amount of the stuff to work its way into your brain. The more you eat, the more rapid the infection process is able to complete. Likely, because as the stuff enters the brain, it may be existing within the synaptic gaps of the neurons and taking over the firing of the neurons in key places. So for instance, things like dopamine receptors would be constantly activated every time you eat the stuff so that the stuff is reinforced with more of itself. The sweet taste gets you at first and the actual control of your neural receptors is what keeps you coming back. The stuff likely also has in general control over portions of your brain as well. Things that would facilitate movement like walking, grasping, and movement in general would be housed within the cerebellum. Aggression would be activated in the amygdala. So in a way, co-opting the firing of nerve signals simply by adding in extra neurotransmitter activation along with the signal already being sent. And in a way, this would be control. But considering at this point, the brain itself is at a level of a highly addicted person, things like friends, family, interest, hobbies would all fall to the wayside, sort of like what we see with other addictions in our society as they only crave the stuff due to the neurotransmitter cocktail in their brain at the moment. However, as the infection progresses, they will continue to degrade. For any creature to survive, there needs to be an inflow of energy and chemicals, and this is how the biology of any living creature is maintained. We have to eat. Birds have to eat. Microbes have to eat. Hamsters have to eat. Anything eaten is incorporated into their bodies, showing that you really are what you eat, and the stuff is no different. So this is the biggest issue and why the mom was losing weight and why pretty much everybody loses weight on the stuff. Because as you eat it and your brain no longer tells you that you're hungry, fat would be turned to to break down for nutrients because the body would still be struggling as nutrients weren't coming in. But this will be rectified as the stuff continues amassing within your meat suit. So after taking control of a person, like I said, the body is slowly broken down from the inside out. Likely the intestines are the first thing to go as the stuff would enter here and control and suppress hunger hormones. Once broken down, the stuff likely does release a certain amount of glucose into the body to help the muscles remain functional and moving. And this would explain the energy the people feel despite their body kind of being like a candle being burned at both ends. Yeah, you have more light, but you're definitely heading towards complete darkness very soon. But other portions of the body are broken down as well, such as the skeletal system, and this would make the body incredibly weak and frail, allowing for something like a single punch to cave in the face of a person as the structural support is no longer there. Eventually, as it continues, you are quite literally having the stuff melt down almost every portion of your body internally, and then turn towards its own movement to mimic a human structure. It basically gets to the point where enough of the stuff has divided and spread within the body of a person to reach a level of consciousness that it becomes aware of what it's in and what it's dealing with. And this is where it 
ops to keep the skin of the person along with some of the structural supports such as you know things in the mouth and the shape of the skull as to mimic a human the person that it used to be in control of however or at least the control of the meat suit is long gone and this would allow for stuff to move around in whatever form the original predator was and then take out localized groups say if like a pack of wolves for some reason found the stuff and started eating it the stuff could take the form of that wolf go back to the pack looking like them and then infect the others eliminating the threat to itself or on a more microscopic level the stuff may be able to enter other invading microorganisms look like them enter a colony and then take out the entire group by being able to interact by wearing the cell skin so it kind of reminds you of the thing doesn't it except in this case it's a delicious paste found in the ground which we would totally eat without knowing what the name of all that is holy is in this thing